Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I hope everyone enjoyed the trade show and our quick break. Um, so now we are going to get into our NAN housing strategy update presentation. Um, last year at our housing summit, uh, we provided an overview of the strategy and how we had developed it over the course of the couple years. Um, and now we'd like to provide an update on where we're at and uh, what activities we have completed since then. Um, so I would like to welcome Mike McKay from the Infrastructure and Housing Department. He is our director and fearless leader at NAN. And I would also like to welcome Jeffrey Herskovitz from Together Design Lab, um, who are our partners on the NAN housing strategy. And they will deliver the updates on the initiatives and progress to date regarding the strategy and its associated projects. So welcome Mike, welcome Jeff. Again, um, hope you enjoyed the uh, the trade show. I know a number of people are still in there, uh, talking with some of the booths and uh, some, some interesting products and and programs uh, that are being delivered and offered that are available for community. So that's um, that's great to see. Uh, so as Aaron said, um, uh, that we will be providing the uh, NAN uh, housing strategy update. And so, um, yeah, I'll just, uh, yeah, we'll just get going on the, uh, on the update of the, the housing strategy. And so, um, uh, heading over to the, so the, boy, I have the clicker here. Okay, so, um, So first uh, slide here. So why the NAN housing strategy? So we began <coughs> the, to develop the NAN housing strategy over five years ago. Uh, in 2014, the uh, NAN chiefs and assembly declared an, a NAN-wide uh, housing state of emergency. The, uh, this declaration um, came as a result of decades of inappropriate intervention and led the chiefs to describe the conditions being faced and leading to extensive health issues, short housing life, overcrowding, and extreme mold. Four years later, in 2018, uh, facing continued widespread housing insecurity, the NAN Chiefs and Assembly reasserted the emergency and mandated the creation of the uh, updated NAN housing strategy. Development of this strategy focused on community-based understandings of housing need and is rooted in local solutions developed by community members. In thinking about the about addressing the housing emergency declared by the chiefs, we placed a large importance on the idea of a housing strategy being community-based and based around experiences of community members. Housing is more than a physical structure that provides us shelter. It is where we should feel safe and includes our families and loved ones, the land it's on and the aspects of community. Housing needs to be viewed holistically and as a critical part of both individual and community well-being. Improving uh, our health and well-being means building better housing and infrastructure. To understand any problem, we need to go to the, to the roots. To find out the cause of why housing isn't as safe or appropriate for communities as it should be. And during the last few years, we have heard from communities and specific ways they exper experience the housing emergency. In this presentation, I will quickly review how the strategy was developed and how it presents as actions as well as discussing some of what our team has done in the last year as we work towards implementing the housing strategy. So beginning in 2018, the team, uh, the team developing the NAN housing strategy began engaging leadership and community members to understand the lived experiences of youth, children, adults, both young and old with 
housing on reserve. We were mandated to create a strategy that reflected the lived experiences of NAN communities and develop solutions rooted in community. To create a strategy that is community-based and ensures the rights, the right of access to adequate housing in order to end the collective housing emergency in the Anishinaabe Aski Nation territory. In 2018, we partnered with a Together Design Lab from uh, the Tr Toronto Metropolitan University in developing the strategy. They have uh, extensive um, um, experience working with uh, other communities uh, within uh, within uh, the NAN territory. And so they brought uh, great experience in, uh, with them. From 2019 to 2020, you'll see uh, kind of a chart here of a, a timeline of uh, the years. So in 2019 and 20, we listened to and learned from NAN community members through various community engagements during each community visit, we sat down with leadership, housing managers, elders, education directors, health directors, health staff, um, youth councils, and any community member that wanted to hear her get their uh, uh, voice heard through this process. We understood throughout this time as well that communities were facing immediate housing need, and while a long-term strategy was required, so too was action. So throughout this period of development, we also supported communities on more immediate action and advo advocacy, trying to create change as quickly as possible. In 2021, we started drafting the NAN Housing Strategy Roadmap and initially had five themes, but through the review and further discussions, the roadmap roadmap was expanded to seven themes. The draft roadmap was reviewed by the NAN Chiefs and Assembly and the Chiefs Committee on Housing and Infrastructure before it was finally submitted in, 2000, in August 2022 at the Q, at Kiwewin Chiefs Assembly, where it received its full mandate in implementation. As well, just to note, in, in the trade show, there, we have the NAN booth and there there are copies of the NAN housing strategy there if you haven't had one yet. The development of the strategy's vision was to fulfill the human right to access to adequate housing and end the collective housing emergency in the NAN territory. And there are four interrelated goals. These goals were foundational to the work in supporting self-determination and have supported, um, have supported the development of the sub seven themes in the, um, in the roadmap. Should I get mixed up? So moving forward, the vision of the strategy is creating positive change and the current housing system to support health and wellness and to fulfill the human right of access to adequate housing. To achieve the NAN housing strategy goals, four objectives have guided its development. The objectives recognize that an approach to housing solutions need to be community-led and cultural, culturally appropriate. Otherwise, they will not work in, that, in the NAN communities and risk further extending the NAN housing, uh, housing emergency. The First Nations are not stakeholders. They are leaders and partners and rights holders. The First Nations have the right to self-determination to their housing systems. And so the strategy focuses on creating tools and resources that support the development of local housing systems through housing procurement, local, um, tendering, management, and appropriate construction designs and building techniques. And that communities should have, should be able to access appropriate designs and pursue their own housing designs. Housing should reflect the values and cultures of people who live in them. Homes should feel safe and be able to have a place to create memories.
The NAN housing strategy encompasses a vision for creating positive change in the current housing systems to support health and wellness and to fulfill the human right of access to adequate housing. The seven themes are broad because the process will always be dynamic and uh, there will be no one size fits all solution. So listed here, we have the roadmap, which consists of seven themes, which, in, which includes st strategies that focus on creating change in local housing systems. There are short and long-term goals identified within each of the seven areas, as well as expected achieve achievements once goals are met. The NAN housing strategy roadmap themes are advocating for inclusive housing systems, addressing health impacts of housing, appropriate and sustainable design and materials, integrated infrastructure planning, alternative funding structures, governance and policy reform, and lastly, capacity development and training. So in the roadmap, the themes in, include references to projects as current actions we are taking to support housing needs in our communities. So here's just a diagram of some of the, um, the, uh, the projects that have happened since the, uh, since the work of the NAN housing strategy have, uh, have uh, progressed. Like I mentioned earlier within my uh, presentation, we have the cold, uh, cold shine project, the community-led designs for specialized housing in the north. Um, I know Jeff here will be uh, talking about uh, within this presentation some of the some of the other other uh, projects we have going. And something uh, I know Grand Chief talked about it this morning with his uh, opening remarks about um, the um, the health consequences due, due due to housing like mold and uh and overcrowding and then some a project that we worked on was the indoor air quality study and there we partnered with uh, the children's hospital of eastern ontario we walked with uh we worked with uh, it was led by uh the lead researcher was uh, dr tom cabessi it was a two-year project where we um we uh worked with um three communities and we were within we uh so it was about a hundred homes and it was the um, um we worked with uh, families and children that were impacted due to the uh the due to the uh, poor indoor air quality um and that work has been completed uh with i think uh, probably a year ago or so uh the research from that was published in the, the, Canadian, the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And so it's been published and it's, uh, it's uh, kind of an external uh, research paper that, uh, that uh, anyone can access. So it's something that leadership have been saying, uh, I know leadership, community leadership, the chiefs have said, you know, that housing is making us sick. And so now that um, we have that, uh, leadership do have that data to back up what they're saying. Uh, so many of the, the projects that we have completed are being currently uh, undertaken. Uh, so one or more of the themes. So the projects were created in response to discussions and recommendations from community engagements. So as uh, for the update today, um, we will uh, be providing uh, an update on the uh, creating a home for our youth, recording our truth, immediate housing needs, and true cost of housing in the north. Uh, and tomorrow, we will provide an update and panel discussion on the community-led designs for specialized housing in the north uh, at 9.30 in this room. 
So that's the uh, the project that responds to one of the greatest needs we heard through the communities is uh, stamp drawings for shovel ready housing plans that are appropriate for the land territory. So I'll hand this over to uh, Jeff for his uh, for his update. Thank. You. Um, I'll begin speaking to some of the projects that have been completed or are completed. Um, starting with creating a home for our youth. As, as Mike already described, the first theme of NAN's housing strategy is inclusive housing systems, which really means creating housing um, for everyone and making sure that no one in any of your communities is left behind. And where that, where that theme came from was in our community work, mostly in, in 2019, um, as we traveled across the territory again and again, we heard that there were specific populations or, or groups of people who found it especially difficult um, to find home. And the first population that, that we heard from again and again um, was youth. And the particular challenges that youth face um, in finding home both in their communities and here in town and in other centers um, across the North. So um, in, in 2019, we, we began working with the Shkadaza Council. Um, I think there might be folks from the council here today, there usually are, um, to create creating a home for our youth. Um, the primary kind of focus of creating a home for our youth was these long form interviews with young people from across the territory where um, we sat with and listened to the stories young people told of where they had made home over the course of their lives um, and what it had meant for them to try to find home. And for many young people, um, well, all of them who were interviewed, but, but in different ways, their homes had been um, institutionalized in different ways. Um, and, and it was a number of provincial systems that, that had brought them home, whether that be um, the education system when they came here to town or, or to Sulukout or to Timmins to go to high school, um, whether it be the child welfare system, um, the healthcare system when, when folks are in need of care or, or the justice system. And so the, the focus of those interviews became these kind of alternate forms of housing um, and, and institutional forms of housing. The final report, which um, will be released soon, and if you'd like to learn more about it, come visit us at the, the NAN booth in the trade show, which will also be there um, as part of the, the Quilt China open house tomorrow, and we're all happy to talk about it more. The final report details both the methodology and of course the findings um, where we do center youth voices. That This is not a report, um, although it is about institutions that, that, that reads as super complicated. Instead, what we try to do is um, is share what youth told us in their own words about the challenges of finding housing and what it means for their health and well-being that finding housing is so difficult. Um, while the experience of each young person um, is different, of course, and um, everyone's journey to housing is, is individual, what the report focuses on is the kind of shared challenges that those young people experience what their shared barriers to housing were, um, what they identified as solutions and ways that we can make change to make sure that young people of the next generation don't suffer the same challenges that they do. Um, and of course, what the, the impact of the ongoing housing crisis meant in their lives. Um, today, I'm gonna share just a few of those learnings and try to share with you um, some of the voices of youth as, as best I can. Um, First, and at the highest possible level, the, the main takeaway from CAFOI is the, the idea that we have a generation of young people um, who, because of the on-reserve housing emergency, feel as though they must leave their community to find safe and appropriate housing at different times in their life. They're forced away from their homes and their families, the places that they know best, in order to secure somewhere safe. Second, youth can't make a single long-term stable home. That's not an option available to them because of the lack of services available in their home communities and because of the forced displacement that they experience 
across various life milestones. And so the idea of a single safe and appropriate home isn't one afforded to young people in man territory today. And instead, um, they're forced to make a number of difficult decisions in search of home that can lead to ongoing housing precarity and homelessness both in town and in their home community. Next, access to social housing, when it is available to them, especially in town, um, has acted as a lifeline for young people. Um, while the wait times are long and the system often difficult to navigate, it is the place that young people have often found home for themselves. Next, and, and one that I, I think I can't overstate, is the idea of the importance of social networks. Uh, many of you in this room who I've gotten to know over the last few years, whether it be through the development of man housing strategy, cold shine, or, or work in your communities, and it is nice to see some old familiar faces here, ha has acted, have acted as lifelines to young people. You have housed young people when they had nowhere else to go. You have provided somewhere safe, and you know many other people in your communities who have done that, whether it be... Um, at home in the north or whether it be in town here. Young people are often forced to, to um, use every, every network and connection they have to find somewhere safe because the, the systems that are in place that should catch them often don't. And lastly, there's a lack of safe spaces for young people. Those can be safe homes, they can be community centers, they can be a whole range of other spaces where young people can go when things aren't feeling safe in the places they live right now. Um, it can be somewhere you need to go just for a night when things aren't going well or somewhere you might need to stay a while, but we need safe spaces for you. Um, we need them here in town. We need them across the north. Um, the next two slides, and I'll leave this on screen for a while and please ignore me for the next couple of minutes and just read the words on screen give you an idea of what the Creating a Home for Our Youth report looks like. These are the words of young people from across NAN territory. Um, these are the words that matter in this report, not what I will say here. The, the first quote you see on, on screen and in the blue is about um, youth experience of homelessness while they're away to attend high school. I'll read just part of it. I think like Indigenous students especially, like a lot of us end up homeless or couch surfing. So even when those tools inside of the high school, to any options that are available, yeah, it would have been nice to know too about the priority list sooner because by the time I knew about it, I already had three kids in the one bedroom. Um, I'll, I won't read all of these quotes. They don't mean nearly as much in my voice, but I'll leave them with you. Um, the second here about a, a youth speaking about what home should be in their life. And then on the next slide, um, a quote about, about the need for safe spaces, as I mentioned earlier. And, and creating a home for our youth is really about sharing these voices, sharing the struggle for home, and sharing a, a desire for what home should be for, for the next generation. Um, as we kind of transition here into more specific learnings for the report, I'll, I'll say that I'll, I'm going to go through these very quickly. Um, it's a long report with many, many recommendations. And again, come speak with us at the, at the booth if you'd like to learn more, and, and we'll be happy to share with you when the report is finalized. Today, I'll, I'll leave us with some quick learnings from both the housing and infrastructure areas of action and very quickly some social services actions. Um, as everyone in this room knows, and the reason all of you do the work that you do, the first thing that needs to happen to end the, this um, struggle for young people is that the immediate housing need on reserve needs to be addressed. The 7,500 homes that we know are needed across the territory must be built. The lots that are needed for those homes to be built on, the infrastructure that has to serve those homes, that must happen, and it must happen immediately. And that is just the first step towards addressing housing for you. Um, and, and I know personally and thank all of you in the room who basically day to day work at the front line of that emergency, work at the front line of serving people who need homes, 
um, much more than I do, and I appreciate the effort that all of you make in that critical play. The next is the need, and I know there are people in the room as well who work on this one, the need for emergency housing and transitional housing in every community in the North. Now, youth have specific need here, and there are need for youth um, emergency safe spaces and transitional housing, but this need is larger than that, and it is a need for emergency housing and transitional housing in every community. Um, as well, and, and directly related to that, is the need for capacity in town, in urban centers across the North, um, for systems navigation. In many of our interviews, the stories we heard were of young people who eventually found a program that could help them, who eventually received a service. But for too long, they waited and, and were homeless or really precariously housed and suffered the kind of related mental health challenges because they didn't know what programs were available to them. And we need to stop that pattern and, and find ways to quickly get youth um, into the programs that they, have, they should have access to. One of the recommendations coming directly from young people um, was that packages be made available in all high schools um, that speak specifically to housing concerns. Too many young people have to leave school um, because they are unhoused or because they're homeless. That shouldn't be the case. Young people shouldn't have to make the choice between having somewhere safe to live and going to school and too many times, that's the choice that we heard. Um, and again, I, I will say, there needs to be safe spaces for young people on reserve and in town. Those spaces should be designed specifically for young people and in town specifically for First Nations young people. Um, and, and that is, as young people have told us again and again, the way to stop the kind of pipeline to homelessness. Very quickly, I know this isn't necessarily the forum for it, although I know many of you here do work in, in kind of social services as well. A few recommendations there. First, the idea that there needs to be a First Nations education counselor in every high school environment. We need integrated case management. We know that young people are mobile between cities, between their home communities and cities. And too often your case management, whether it be with a social worker or someone else, gets left in one jurisdiction and can't carry you through. We need safe transportation options. Um, folks have to come to town and they need safe ways to do it. Folks need to travel around town and they need safe ways to do it. Those just aren't available right now. Um, you know, things like creating access to a universal basic income would increase the number of housing options available to young people. And as I said, stop these choices that are choices between having somewhere safe to live and going to school having somewhere safe to live and staying in relationships that are unhealthy for you. Um, young people need access to housing. And uh, finally, we need to implement the recommendations of other reports that have come before this instead of um, me repeating the same recommendations over and over again. Many of you um, have worked hard and told stories as a part of the 7 Youth Inquest mis missing and murdered indigenous women and girls who make clear recommendations about the need for housing um, and the need for everyone to have home. Again, if you'd like to learn more about this, please reach out to any of the NAN staff or TDL staff. We, we have a booth in the next room. Um, and quickly, um, and kind of for the first time publicly, we'd like to talk about recording our truth. Um, before I talk about this project, I and, and I think certainly on behalf of Mike, want to offer my, my thanks to the elders who took part in recording our truth. Recording Our Truth is a project that came again from our community work in 2019, where we met with elders councils from across the North to learn um, about the kind of history of housing, how we ended up in, in the housing situations we have in their communities, and also to hear from elders the advice on, on where to go next. And the kind of recommendation we were given again and again was to make sure that we were recording these stories um, and, and providing NAN housing strategy with this framework or this foundation of elders' knowledge. And so Recording Our Truth does that. It records the stories of elders from across NAN territory in a discussion of both the kind of legacy of how we ended up in a, in a housing emergency and, and documenting their visions for the future. 
Um, I'm just going to talk really quickly about three concepts that came from those um, elders interviews and also say that if there's an elder in your community who you think could be a kind of positive contribution to this project, whose voice on, on housing and homes ought to be recorded, please reach out to Mike or myself or others from the project team, as these are stories we continue to collect. But um, three concepts I want to speak about here that, that shape how we think about home and the, the work we do in this moving forward, and they are home, housing, and homelands. First, to talk about home, and, and the idea of home, as it's, as it's talked about um, by elders, it is not a physical one. I know most of us here are folks who build physical things, but home is a concept much more tied to relations and, and kin and identity. And for the elders who I spoke to, home was a concept that they remembered very strongly from their childhoods. And it was related to where and how they grew up, the people they grew up with, and, and was something really strong and positive in their lives. But unfortunately, for each of the elders that I interviewed, there came a moment, um, for some quite young in childhood, for some a little bit later, where their connection to home was broken. And it was broken either by residential schools um, or by uh, kind of forced relocation in, in, into permanent settlement on reserve. And with that breaking came a kind of disconnection from some of the, the relations and some of the life ways that they held most important to them. Second, a concept of housing, which I won't really talk about here because it's the thing that we all do and talk about, I think, in our jobs. Housing is the physical, and the crisis of housing that elders spoke about was one about um, persistent overcrowding, about the low quality of homes that they see families having to live in now, about the short lifespan of homes, and, and really about the kind of critical need for, for change in the physical structures that we live in certainly about the poor air quality as well that, that Mike spoke about just before. And lastly, is the concept of homelands. Um, it's about the lands and the waterways that make up Nan territory. And as one elder in a pretty frustrated way told me kind of halfway through our discussion, we are Nishnabe Aski, we are people of the land. And yet, when he looks to the current generation and to the future, increasingly access to those waterways and to the lands um, is being lost and is something that cannot be lost. So to kind of sum up the in a very quick way, um, learnings from these discussions with elders, there is a, a kind of dual crisis of home and of housing. And that while the work on restoring physical structures and, and ensuring that, that housing is appropriate for the North is important, it alone will not solve the kind of full picture that NAN housing strategy looks to address. That it's also in restoring the concept of home and the connections to kin and to culture and to place um, that the kind of holistic healing work of man housing strategy has to be accomplished. And so it's both the crisis of housing and home that man housing strategy looks to, um, looks to address. I will pass back to Mike now to discuss immediate needs. Okay, so the uh, immediate housing and infrastructure needs project was de was developed to identify the a, a base estimate for the NAN housing and infrastructure needs. The project uses available data from government sources and NAN reports to highlight immediate need until more accurate data exists. The project illustrates using government data, just how large the infrastructure and housing gap across land territory. So we used a variety of data sets here and sources listed here. 
Both uh, sources provide a significant range of housing needs, which demonstrate the need for more accurate, reliable, and re regular data sources. And the, uh, it was the direction of the NAN leadership that, um, that they provided when we did, um, when we started the NAN housing strategy is that, you know, that's a long-term initiative, that's a long-term vision and we need some immediate action and advocacy. And so this was a way that, you know, that um, we've worked with the development of the strategy along with uh, to allow NAN to advoc advocate for uh, the need that uh, the immediate need that's that's required. <clears throat> so our our estimate for housing needs across NAN is approximately seven thousand five hundred units. The estimate looked at housing that is in need of replacement based on age and the number of new units that would need to be added. Using a li lifespan estimate of 30 years, 33% or about 2,500 current housing units across NAN needs to be replaced. That means that over 5,000 new units need to be added. And while lots and while and while lots already exist for replacement units, there are only an average of four serviceable lots available per community. This number was based on a 2019 AFN survey data and has likely changed. And so I know that's a challenge within many of the communities that, you know, when they do are successful in um, accessing funding to build housing units that they lack the serviceable lots to build on them. From reviewing annual performance inspection reports and assessments, we estimate, estimate that one in three water treatment systems, one in two wastewater treatment systems, and one in three uh, waste management systems are in need of replacement today. <clears throat> we can also say that our estimates and other data that there is a severe and extreme infrastructure shortage. If, uh, if we were to try to meet current need, um, not even pre future need, the rapid expansion of upgrades to all infrastructure is needed. And so as we communities and try to tackle the, um, the housing need, there's also the, the, um, the related infrastructure that, that's needed as well. So the key, some key take, takeaways from the immediate housing need reports the estimate shows that there there are, and there are a significant housing and infrastructure gaps. Um, so first takeaway, uh, when we we look at the range of total new housing construction needed, it is likely NAN needs approximately seven thousand five hundred new units. This estimate this estimate was endorsed by the chiefs in assembly in the spring of two thousand twenty two. Um, so this estimate. Um, does not include future growth or the number of, ho or of housing or community members wanting to return, return to their communities. The second tech takeaway is the replacement rate, rate based on house, of housing age. 33% of the current housing stock will need to be replaced due to the age and conditions. If uh, we continue to use a 30 year ho uh, housing lifespan, that will mean that by 2030, an additional 24% of the current housing stock will also need to be replaced or that one in two houses will need to be replaced. Quality of, con quality of construction and materials is needed to increase the housing lifespan of uh, beyond 30 years. Third, 
taking all, taking all this into account, current funding, federal funding commitments are not enough. A significant increase is needed for, for both infrastructure and housing. Many communities are planning to build on their, la their last serviced lots if they haven't already. So housing funding without appropriate infrastructure funding will stall construction and further add to wait lists in the communities. Yeah, so without that adequate infrastructure funding, community members will still continue to uh, face uh, uh, community housing emergencies. So the, the true cost of housing project um, was developed with conversations with housing managers and chiefs, uh, chief and councils that identified the gaps in current funding programs. True cost recognizes there are many additional costs and challenges to constructing homes in the north that are not covered. In early, in early earlier phases of this project, we collected information through a survey and several communities shared information with us and that helped us develop a true cost model. In uh, the fall of 2000 or fall of uh, 2023, we contracted a quantity surveyor to help continue to compile data and refine the model to, to estimate both housing and infrastructure costs. The refined model will use a, a base count with a number of, of factors and, and have three levels of escalation based on different contents communities face. Factors includes access to granular material, freight methods, labor force, and size, and the size of the building project to the name of a few. Uh, linear infrastructure and cost of loft development will be added once the housing estimate estimates are more complete. We are hoping that um, yeah you can support us in this project. Um, we do have uh, within our NAN booth we do have a survey there that uh, uh, and a questionnaire that can kind of help us continue to refine and develop that uh, refine that uh, refine that model. So it's uh, just by answering a few of the questions uh, that will help us to improve uh, improve that project and uh, our advocacy. So ongoing advocacy, it is, um, uh, I know you, Grand Chief had mentioned yesterday that there was the, uh, the, the, the announcement of the, the federal budget um, also important to note this month, uh, the AFN released their report on the uh, closing the infrastructure gap by 2030. And uh, reported in Ontario, the need is uh, 49 billion to uh, in capital funding in order to ad address the current infrastructure needs. All, along with that, uh, previous to that, the Auditor General had released a report released a report uh, uh, on the condition of the delivery of the uh, of the housing program for communities. And so that's something, uh, I think we have copies of that for uh, for, the, for the delegates that are, are here for the next couple of days. So if you do need a copy, we've made that available. We will continue to work with all those who are looking to address the housing emergency faced in our territory. And uh, and we and that very much includes all of uh, all of you here today. We want to continue to collaborate in addressing uh, your priorities. So in so uh, yeah, thank you. That kind of comes to an end of our presentation. Uh, again, if you are interested in any of the projects shared today. Uh, let us know. We'll happy be happy to share available reporting or discuss findings with you. 
if you have any material from many of these projects available, um, yeah, we have these materials available at our, at, at the, at our booth. So yeah, thank you again uh, for, for uh, listening in on our presentation. Anything else? There's a little bit of time before lunch, so we can take questions here, but also people oh, yeah. can go to the trip. So we'll be up here at the front. If you have questions for us about any of the specific projects, we're happy to field them here. We'll also have um, folks at the booth where all of the material is, and you're you're welcome to kind of um, head back to the trade show. And then I, I think lunch will just be in a little bit. But Mike and I will stay up here if you have any questions about particular projects or, or the non-housing strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as Jeff said, we are available for questions if you want. Again, the trade show is open all day. You're welcome to go over there as well. Uh, but yeah, we are available for questions.
work. Okay. Um, just wanted to give everyone a heads up. We're going to be starting in about five minutes. Uh, we'll be sorting through some presentations and getting the sense of Adler. So we're going to be starting in about five minutes.
afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch, the trade show, chatting, networking. Uh, I've overheard a lot of great conversations, and I hope you'll come back in and join us and enjoy the rest of the trade show. I just wanted to give a quick reminder that we do have um, a mental health counselor who is here um, in the courtroom for Stephen. Um, she is in the IT Center, so if you have anyone who requires support or wants to chat um, or just check in with her, feel free to be here. Um, and if anything else is required, please don't hesitate to come and find one of the NAND staff or the CL staff, and we'd be happy to help you out with that. Um, so for this afternoon, uh, we're going to hear from some of our NAND community members. Uh, we have our panel on innovation in housing and demographic housing initiatives. Um, and I'm going to invite representatives from different NAND communities to join me on stage and participate in our panel discussion. This panel discussion will highlight housing solutions and innovati innovative initiatives in addressing housing challenges in NAND territory and the demographic housing initiative and other housing initiatives. The panel aims to highlight the pathways towards community success and building inclusive housing solutions in the NAND territory. So I would now like to invite our panel participants to the stage. Please help me welcome Steve Tam from Sheriff District First Nation, George from Yevmatung First Nation, Bernard from Arrowland First Nation, Andrew from Port Albany First Nation, and Albelina from the Meshkigawak Development Corp. Please join me on stage and uh, we'll get our panel discussion started. I've given them a bit of an order, but I'm happy to go out of order however you feel like you need to do it and feel comfortable. Um, I'd like to invite Jeff up here to moderate our panel this afternoon. Right. You can start the presentation, Jeff. got the mic right in front of me, so I'll, I'll move first. Um, we're going to let each community give a little little intro to their project. We'll open it up then to the floor. Um, I would encourage you to ask questions about each community's project, um, and if everyone's feeling shy, it's okay to just raise your hand. I don't see you, but um, Steve, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good afternoon. What uh, As I just said, uh, Uh, during that year, uh, I 
that uh, we have to do that. So this, uh, so this uh, Larry Yeshi said, thankful that we were able to complete all this uh, really quick knowing that uh, according to the time uh, that we are given but uh, but I will digress a moment uh, I chose uh, it as a, uh, another uh, funding I think that would be more appropriate uh, or better for First Nations up north that we like have it on Montserrat it says uh, that we were given, I mean, if the First Nations are given more time, you know, <laughs> we were notified that their applications are approved maybe in the middle of summer. So that will we, we, will, we will have more time, you know, to be ready, you know, to uh, select uh, our building, building suppliers and, con build and contractors, you know, be ready. We to have the housing blocks ready. So that uh, that would be one of my recommendations just to get a, the another RHI uh, uh, happening in our in the future. <laughs> I don't know. Am I talking too much? You, you're okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm being too Just keep talking. Okay. Keep All right. Anyways, um, I think that's pretty well uh, going to summarize our project and um, I think that um, I'm not saying that uh, we still have we still have people that need housing that houses uh, that need uh, proper accommodations on in, in my community in my Lakeshore uh, like for example we do have uh, I think the priority uh, we usually look at is uh, shelter those people that are critically elderly, you know, and some of these houses that we had built, we, they were built, they came with ramps, you know, the, uh, the and uh, specialized uh, boxes. We have some of those units built for our community. So I think uh, there's more that needs to be done in my community. So that's pretty well it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. And um, it is exciting to see the photos of the finished product on the screen now. I know last time you presented this project, it was all still very much in motion. So uh, thanks, Chief. And I think, George, we're coming to you next. Do you have a microphone in front of you, or I can bring you to some of the stand if you want? John's not in on the presentation. If you sit it over there, if you really want to talk to him later, I'm sure he'll talk to you. George on his behalf today. Hello. George, I'm Hey. Hello, everybody. My name is George McConnell. I'm from Fort Oak, Ontario. I'm a housing coordinator and glad to be here. I like the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now, we're uh, doing uh, 10 units underway. Uh, the third RHI uh, build-out had three units. Last year we did two duplexes and one single unit. The year before we did five duplexes. So it's the same problem we used to have. We're running out of lots. And the houses and the overcrowding and the lack of infrastructure. So just happy to be here. <laughs> couple of photos of the projects that uh, George and, and the team are working on on the screen, and certainly if there's questions for him, um, there'll be the opportunity after. George, you mind a few words today? Or shall I? Do you want to talk us through it? Yeah, right now uh, we're using a fuel pile system, fuel jack or whatever it is, uh, with uh, wood, uh, floor joists and uh, sit panels, try to make the 
husband go faster so that you can hold the timing? Um, you guys have been using clip timers for for a long time, right? Yeah, I've been using them for a few years now. Uh, lots of extra time. No, uh, no, they're they're good. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, certainly, if there's questions for George at the end here, um, he'll he'll be happy to take those. And the third presentation we have up. talking about uh, our elders uh, elders lodge project that uh, we're uh, going to be building here in the very near future we need to run our dog here uh, the funding to this project was funded through uh, infrastructure Canada through the CIC G program green and the and then through the community building program but the uh, funding unit uh, elders uh, project, elders complex, get to give away a little bit of uh, my dad from there. But uh, these are uh, one bedroom uh, units. And uh, the whole building will uh, consist of a dining hall with outside patio, communal, communal kitchen, can yeah they I guess they can get in there but they'll have their own uh, they'll also have their own uh, living area uh, craft room will be there there'll be a craft room exercise room health offices and other office for uh, PSW we'll be hiring uh, a lot of uh, PSW to work in the in the building uh, exterior area sir Conceptual design and project planning started back in April 2021, up to April 22. Design and cost estimates, our timeline went from December 2022 20 to November 2023. Develop construction and tender package went out on November of uh, August 2023 up to January. Construction tender period went from February to March of last month. Construction contract and award in preparation for uh, is going on. Construction mobilization will happen uh, within a few weeks. Uh, we're just having our ground breaking ceremony uh, at the end of uh, on the 30th of uh, April. Construction period is going to take from uh, June 2024. Projecting to be completed for uh, December 2025. Commission of uh, operation maintenance will be from January 2026 to June 2026. Uh, type of construction that we're doing is uh, building uh, light wood frame construction with wood trusses. This was chosen through uh, cost cost effectiveness, low embodied and carbon emissions and achieve the ZCB uh, standards and access avail availability. Local and e economic benefits is going to be, uh, we'll be housing, uh, I mean we'll be employing community members. We've uh, hired a contractor from uh, Manitoba that, was, that came uh, under the under the tender there. So they'll be uh, doing a job fair as well when they uh, come to the community. 
So uh, it was a different kind of way for me to to uh, address uh, how you say uh, like uh, what am I going to say? Now I'm lost here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, addressing uh, overcrowding or. Some of our elders, these houses, the houses we're living in right now, they were built maybe 30 years ago. And the uh, the tenants that live there right now, they're, uh, they're having mobility issues and these buildings have stairs and it's hard for us to, we have to change the bathrooms to for elders, like put in a stand-up shower, put on a higher... Uh, toilet seats, like doing all kinds of renovations to these houses for these uh, elders. So now uh, there's about, uh, I'd say maybe eight, eight elders that are living in four bedroom units. And uh, once this uh, com uh, construction is completed, this will free up uh, these homes for uh, younger families that are overcrowding in their, uh, in their uh, current current housing so this is uh this helping a lot for our uh community for housing anyway for for people and this will uh keep uh, this building will keep our elders in the community for a longer period of time because right now we're losing our elders because of their mobility issues they're uh moving to towns or, or moving into hospitals there where they'll get uh well they'll get where they're getting treatment but uh with this uh with this new building i think it will keep our uh our elders in the in the community for a long period of time and uh and it's uh it's it's going to be a big project and uh we're looking forward to it and uh looking forward to the completion of it and uh like I said, if there's any other questions later on, I'll be happy to answer them. Miigwech. Thanks, Bernard. And we'll, we'll have to make sure you're on the panel again in two years to give the update oh, yeah. when it's all completed. Oh, yeah, I'll be back. I, I appreciate you saying you're looking forward to the project, but I, looking forward to completion is really the... For sure. The, um, I'm sure you'll have a, a number of headaches in the two oh, years I, between I, now and then, but you, you'll get there. Yeah. Um, we queue up the next. You're up next. Do you want the standing mic or would you like the? You want that one. I, I thought everyone was going to want that one. Let's just wait and get your presentation up and then. Uh, Good afternoon. What Jake Misswinehan, Vistabe Loschin, also known as Fort Albany, Ontario. And I'm glad to be here. Glad to be amongst uh, hardworking people to try to get through. Communities all, all fixed up to have people uh, live comfortably as they should, like the rest of Canada. Anyways, I started my position. I'm a project manager for my First Nation. I started in November. I don't know what I'm doing up here, but uh, they asked me to. On Friday, I had a phone call asking me if I want to be on a panel. Automatically, I said, okay. I don't know what the heck I got myself into, but <laughs> here I am. We're uh, grateful for that. Usually I'm not nervous because uh, I usually sing in front of bigger crowds. Kidding. <laughs> anyway, since 2020, we had approximately 45 units built in our community, and we're still continuing today. We're working on to continue our uh, new subdivision. Oh, that's that's the okay. We got you up there now. Okay, I'll I'll work on that and I'll explain the video after. Anyways, uh. We're still continuing and we're still short like everybody else. Uh, we're trying to get everybody housed accordingly. Uh, like you said, everybody has a, an issue of overcrowding. Uh, it's laid out over the place, not even in the, only not only on reserves, but off reserve as well for our members. Uh, what I have behind me on, on the screen right now is the uh, transition home. That transition home was... Uh, was based on our uh, regional uh, women's uh, shelter that was built about 15 years ago. This is where women went for safety with their children. And after they get out, uh, what would they do? 
that they have no recourse to go anywhere. So as a result, two of these are two of these buildings are being in, in uh, construction as we speak. It's so 99.9% .9 done and ready to be occupied by uh, this summer. And I think the grand opening is uh, May 15, June 15, uh, June 15. Anything else? June, 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 July. Okay. Anyways, that's going to be the grand, the grand opening. Uh, there's two of them being built. There's four apartments in each, I believe. And they have a year stay in there to uh, transition to back to society. And they're going to be, uh, during their stay, they're going to be uh, guided or led to uh, what they want to do in life maybe more education or get job training so they can uh, get back to society. Uh, that's one of those uh, not to build places. That's an old lake. And uh, that's uh, luckily it's not underwater right now because there's a lot, a lot of lack of snow. And I think we're going to have issues in the future with that house. So we have to have, remind you that uh, build your houses on proper ground. So I wasn't around when that was started. So if I was, it wouldn't be there right now. Anyhow, uh, next video. That's uh, one of the uh, the guys that are next door here that are advertising for uh, modular homes. That's one of them right there. And there's four of them in our reserve. And uh, that's our test run. If they work out good, we're going to be uh, probably getting more from them. Are you here somewhere? They're not here, they're next door, I guess. Uh, that's going to be our future di uh, division. This summer, we're going to be starting to put new lots, new water lines, sewer lines, hydro. So hopefully it'll be done by uh, by fall. And again, with the winter road, we didn't get much uh, material in. It was a weird year. It's lack of snow on our end, more snow towards the south end of the, of the, of the bay. So it was a difficult year for transportation, but we managed. But uh, housing-wise, I didn't get enough information to uh, start new projects, but uh, there's always next year. Anyways, that's all I'm going to say for now. And what this guy said, I comply with what he's saying. <laughs> we're, all, uh, we're all in the same boat. We're all struggling. You know, we're all working hard to help each other, to help our membership. You want to you? Thank you. Are you okay. No questions at this time, please. <laughs> <laughs> Your time will come for questions. So we we have one final presentation. Um, and then, you know, while that's happening, everybody think of your questions. And if you have one, um, we'll get a mic to you in just a minute. But um, you got a little preview of this final presentation because we had the wrong slides up before. <laughs> but um, to to talk to us about some of the the kind of the supply side of, of housing and, and what Mashkagawak is up to. Thanks. Um, what James say? Albany metatwa bandish na kasan pita bang doshin, which is uh, known as Fort Albany. So my name is um, from Fort Albany. My name is Albany metatwa bin, working for the Regional Development Corporation, uh, Mashkagawak Development Corporation in the Mashkagawak area, and it's owned by six. Partners, five five members of the Mashkego Council, and uh, the council itself is also a member. I mean, an owner. And um, some of the things that we've been working on as a regional development corporation from the housing perspective, um, I, I think it's from the economic development, business development perspective, and you know, trying to reverse that economic leakage that happens within the region and turning that into a opportunities and um, trying to generate wealth and build capacity for for our communities our, our local people within within those communities and um, just in ownership in general of of business and because there's a lot of, of revenue opportunities and um, you know the more businesses you have within your own communities then you're recycling that money and uh, that's very positive for for an economy in general, and especially in our our regions where there's, you know, very little economy in terms of um, businesses and employment. So anything we do, that's that's kind of what we think about as a regional economic development corporation. And um, 
so one of the first things that we did a few years ago was we purchased the the regional building uh, materials and hardware store and that was an operation or a business that ran for 40 years within within the um, area and it was owned by an individual from you know outside of the region but they 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 really wanted the the communities to be the owners once they they left and so we um you know undertook the due diligence the necessary and acquired that operation back in 2019 and it's been operational since and that feeds directly into um housing within the region which is which is critical for all of our communities you know within the nan territory and you know across canada across the first nations across canada in general and so you know that self supply option for communities when they're undertaking housing projects is 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 very important because you know then you're in control of that that supply that supply chain and you have options as to where you you can source your supply and you know we're we're very much at the manufacturer level in terms of sourcing materials and hardware and so that's a very um good position to be in as as a purchaser of goods so that you can pass on that that savings you know to the communities um who are sourcing from you know their the business that they they are owners of and so that picture that you see on the screen is a is a photo of the you know the retail location up in Moosini and it services a regional customer base all of the communities within the area um, there's two communities, you know, that has access to that that retail store year round, and then there are three other communities that have access to it when the winter roads are are open. So they have that you know small window of opportunity to be able to to bring their goods into the to the area. And this operation is is expanding, and it's and it's you know intent to be a supply hub for all of the communities, and you know you know, now we're into industrial commercial and so anything related to infrastructure site development, um, that those materials can be sourced from from this location as well. Um, I also wanted to speak to <clears throat> some some of the uh, housing project that we are involved in as a regional development corporation, which is related to lease services within the communities. And, you know, there's also challenges for police services within the communities and accommodating police services because a lot of times people are coming in uh, police officers are being brought into the and so they require accommodations and so we're on a phase three um, of that project and we've been building a few units in um, the Muskegon council communities uh, more in the northern region uh, some in the southern region as well and um, in this phase three portion that we're starting now, there's 14 units that will be constructed in four different communities. And so we had, you know, similar challenges that have been brought up at this table with respects to logistics. Um, you know, we have to deal with the winter road and you have to deal with, um, you know, the added costs. But also in the communities, it's also been mentioned, it's a common um, issue, it seems, is the availability of land for lots just to be to be able to build anything. And so, you know, as a as a project that's servicing or that's going to be for people that are coming into the community, sometimes that's that's conflicting for the communities because they're trying to build homes and, and whatnot for their their community members and then you're supplying homes for for people that are outside of the community but police services is an essential and it's very much um, um needed in the communities as a as it's a, a function of the safety of the community as well and so um i also wanted to just touch on the partnership that we have with this phase three police housing initiative we're working with uh, one of the um, trade show booths companies and they're called one bowl and they offer a timber frame panel system and so they're going to supply that building envelope and then the self-supply of all of the outfitting materials to finish the the housing will come from the building materials and hardware store that they own so you know there's a, a very large component of indigenous business 
supply happening for for the, this particular project and uh, along with the capacity development you know if there's any training um, that we can you know undertake while we're putting up while we're implementing this project and that we're doing that as well we've had some um, you know carpenter training in phase one as an example and we're we're putting together a training program for this phase as well because it's a new type of building approach and um, we want we want people within the community to be able to be the ones constructing these these units um yeah i think that uh definitely the challenges the for the the funders that are in the room you know government people like if you and and i know it you know you understand the challenges that are there but if if there's some creative idea creative approaches to being able to help community with their issues with accessing you know additional reserve lands to build um covering the costs of the site development which you know in our calculations can be you know minimum of 20 percent of a pro of a housing project you know upwards of um you know who knows like depending on the 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 land that they're building on what challenges that poses is too um i would just you know hopefully that you know that the feedback and the the, the information that's being shared you know, at this table is you know being being taken very seriously and hopefully together we can you know come up with some solutions that will enable all of our communities to be able to to decrease the um or to increase the the housing inventory in all of our communities for the benefit of you know our community members. Thank you, and yeah, I think that summarizes nicely some of the things that we've heard here today. Um, grateful to everyone in sharing their kind of innovative approaches to housing, but also recognizing some of the barriers that that you all face in, in access to lots, the challenges of winter roads. That this year is a great, great example of a time when there was very little access um, and the cost challenges. I'm going to open up to the floor. If there are questions, just give me a wave. And if I don't see you, give me a bigger wave. Um, there'll be a microphone that comes around. So if there if there's anyone that has any any questions for any one of the panelists or all of them, there is an opportunity. Oh, here we go. Um, and if you just, I know who you are, but for everybody else, if you want to introduce yourself and. Grateful also to have representation from Oshkadazak here today, but but go ahead, um, introduce yourself and where you're from. Uh, Watch everyone, uh, Ramon Karakopet, Dijana Kassim from Adwapskut, and I'm on the Youth Council. And uh, Housing is a new portfolio to me, and I've been learning a lot for the last six months now, but I have a question that kind of came up today. So a problem that we have in Attawabaska is getting access to crown land that's right beside the reserve. And that's where we would like to build lots for this housing. I wonder if, have you ever had a battle between crown land and reserve? And if you have, how did you win? I don't know if that's the right word to win. No, that that's a fair question. And I think everyone has brought up the kind of challenge of access to land. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak about the challenge of of, of land access or if anyone's worked on, on that process? If not, I think that's okay too. Here. For, uh, for more land to be houses to be built, this I don't think is an issue. I think INAC just increases your boundary lines as required. That's what we found out uh, in my reserve. Just keep increasing our boundaries as we build. Does that answer your question? Um, how would you increase those boundaries through treaty? Did you say, can you repeat your question? I'm hard of hearing. Um, how would you increase those boundaries? Would that be through the treaty? There's nothing to do with the treaty. It has something to do with just the development of your community. They just increase your boundaries. Like we built our school, it was a, uh, our reserve line was uh, kind of small. So they just moved the boundary lines as required. 
Does that answer your question? Um, it's making me think. Thank you. <laughs> Say you want to build a neighborhood and it's off reserve. You and I can uh, discuss what needs to be, what needs, what is needed, and they increase it. I think that's what was done when I was on council about 50 years ago, 20 years ago. Eat yourself there. And, and I think that process can work differently in, in different communities. Yeah. But that, thanks for sharing your experience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Is there any other questions? Yeah, that's your experience for sure. Is there is there any other? I'm making sure I can see. Um, and I think um, knowing most of the folks up here, um, everyone here would be happy to chat to you about their projects. Um, they're probably all looking forward to getting down from the podium. There, <laughs> folks up here aren't used to being on podiums necessarily, but happy happy to share their projects with you. Photos of what they're working on. Um, you get, you're all going to be here tomorrow as well, right? So, um, if feel free to ask questions then. Um, I think we have a little quick break here, and then um, we're going to come back with a discussion um, about CHRT and and related capital funding. Um, so how long, how long have I been people for? 215, we'll, we'll be back um, for the next session. Thanks, everyone. And, and please feel free to reach out to everyone here. They are exciting projects that are happening in their communities, and um, that there's a lot to learn. That, so thanks again to all our panelists. Yeah. You do. That's a good initiative. You know what? That was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a little bit about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 so those are big projects, along with our uh, tribal council. There's, there's a vehicle outside, an SUV, that has its windows open, and it's pouring rain. So if that might be you, you might want to go close your window. Is that...
So that's okay. Just stay here. I'm just wondering next is I guess they would want to present it from the point. Mm -hmm. Or I mean I'm gonna leave all this and leave wireless.
Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome back to everyone who is here. I know there will be some people trickling in. Popcorn was an excellent treat and unforeseen for me, but my favorite. My bag is still up here next to me. Um, our next our next panel, not really a panel, but kind of a panel, looks like it, um, is actually new to us at the Housing Summit. Um, and I, I think speaks actually to some of the themes of the last panel uh, and the idea of um, innovation in housing and infrastructure and, and moving beyond what is the kind of standard or, or traditional ways of funding housing on reserve and in your communities and looking towards um, how things might be done differently. Certainly new faces probably to most of us here. Um, no offense to Siva, who I was just speaking to and who almost all of us know. Um, he's the 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 older and more traditional face of, of funding housing. And so it's exciting to hear from new folks about new ways of getting um, capital projects built that 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 we know you all need um, desperately in your communities. We certainly hear that need today. And hopefully what's presented here can can present potentially some new avenues towards um, towards getting some things done. Um, we have a, a couple of different programs from Indigenous Services Canada that will be presented or, or different, I don't, is programs fine? Or avenues towards programs maybe? I might get my language wrong here, sorry. Um, but I, I think we're gonna be starting right here with Catherine and Andrea and then we'll we'll follow through with folks after. I will ask that if you have questions, we save them for a little bit and there will be the opportunity after. And I, I think folks will be around for the rest of the day today as well if there are questions that you'd rather ask separately. Is that fair? I haven't committed to any anyone to anything they didn't want. So um, without further ado, you can get us started and, and then yeah, save your questions and you will have the opportunity. Uh, thanks, everyone. I just want to make sure that you can hear me okay. No? More? Okay. How's that? Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having us here today. We are um, very excited to present to you the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal Order 41. So we will be doing it in partnership with uh, First Nation Child and Family Services. Uh, unfortunately, our colleague from Jordan's principal was unable to be here today, but if there are any questions, uh, we will take them back for them to answer. Um, so we'll go on to slide two. So for the Canadian Human Rights Tri Tribunal Order 41, we refer to it a lot as CHRT 41, which we'll see, you'll see as an acronym throughout the presentation. If for, so for in terms of eligibility for funding, spaces and activities uh, for services and activities that are directly funded by Jordan's principal through the First Nation or supporting organization's contribution agreement with Service Canada. So what that means is that you currently have to have approved funding within your funding arrangement in order to be eligible for capital spaces. There is a component of pre-capital planning, which includes feasibility study funding and is available for projects on and off reserve. For projects located on reserve, costs are related to all project phases, including pre-capital planning, design, construction, and project completion are eligible. At this time, off reserve capital assets are not eligible under Jordan's principle However, pre-capital planning is available. There is the avenue of multi-purpose assets, and that's where you'll see a lot of joint partnerships with other funders outside of ISC, but also a partnership with um, Child and Family Services. And that is where um, these are proportionally funded and it's based on program space usage. The delivery of approved Jordan's principal services oh, sorry, funded services, along with unrelated services will be proportionally funded. The project documentation must include the details of the multi-purpose asset as part of the feasibility study to substantiate the most 
effective way to provide approved Jordan's principal funded services. A decision on the capital asset will only reflect the portion of a multi-purpose asset that is intended for the approved Jordan's principal funded services. Funding for the remainder of the asset can be sought through other Government of Canada programs, uh, provincial funding programs, or other application processes. Currently, the expansion of utility services, upgrades, or the extensions of systems such as water, sewer, hydro, um, any of those type of municipal service uh, infrastructure assets are not eligible under CHRT 41. So this means that we can only fund from curb stop uh, where we can't extend the asset, the uh, utility service. It is also important to note that a band council resolution is required to ensure that a common understanding of the proposed project is achieved and well supported by the chief and councils of the communities directly involved. Jordan's principal CHRT 41 funding is available to support services and activities access through Jordan's principal group. The capital request must, must demonstrate how the capital asset will support the approved delivery of services to eligible First Nation children funded through Jordan's principal contribution agreements. Any items funded through an individual crest are not eligible for Jordan's principal CHRT 41 capital funding. Jordan's principal capital projects are funded using the following phased approach. Pre-capital planning 1A, pre-capital 1B, design, tendering for construction, construction, and completion. Pre-capital planning phase 1A is used to determine Jordan's principal space needs by completing a needs assessment, functional program, and functional plan. The needs assessment outlines the scope of existing Jordan's principal activities, staffing requirements, and estimated capital requirements of Jordan's principal services. The functional program identifies how the funded Jordan's principal services will be operationalized, including occupancy by community-based and visiting health professionals, technicians, representatives, and other support staff. The functional plan directly maps services and occupancy to the number, size, and types of spaces required. This estimated square footage will then be confirmed and updated in feasibility study in phase 1B. So the next is pre-capital planning 1B, and this phase is used to examine the relative merit and feasibility of various options to provide the Jordan's principal spaces identified in pre-capital planning phase 1A. So this would be your technical feasibility study, your geotechnical, your site survey, as well as um, sometimes we ask for an environmental project description and sometimes we ask for it during design. And this just may be if you're in a habitat where there's caribou or any type of um, species at risk. The preferred solution, which is identified in the technical feasibility study, is based on the technical and economic considerations. Social considerations and unique needs of the First Nation may also contribute to the preferred solution. The project phase must include identification and analysis of existing community support infrastructure, and then along with the geotechnical survey or geotechnical investigation and site survey. Funding is also available for the community to engage with technical professionals throughout this entire process to complete these components. In the design phase, the licensed design consultant is engaged in accordance with the Indigenous Services Canada tendering policy and works with the project manager to complete the construction tender document. Designs must comply with the Ontario Building Code and all other applicable codes and standards. So the, for the next phase would be um, the tendering process. So before going to tender, Indigenous Service Canada will issue a commitment letter. And this is based on the tender ready package completed in the design phase. The First Nation will then complete a tendering process, submit the tendered results along with the cash flow request. And then if applicable, the First Nation will then submit confirmation of funding from any for any remaining project costs. So this would be for a project where it is joint with another funder. 
and then Indigenous Services Canada will issue an updated approval letter based on the tendered results and deliver the project funding to the uh, First Nation. After completing the tendering process, a contract is awarded to the selected construction company. Indigenous Services Canada then flows funding to the requester and construction begins. The project is considered complete once a certificate of completion is issued, final reporting is submitted, and the warranty period has ended. As a summary to the multiple roles we mentioned in the previous slides, some qualified professionals include licensed project managers who provide overall coordination and management of the project to ensure completion within the approved budget and schedule. Contractors will be used to complete construction in accordance with tender documents and to applicable federal and provincial codes, standards and regulations, and design consultants will coordinate with the chief, the First Nation Council, various committees, and the project team as and when required. So in closing, we just wanted to let everyone know that this presentation will be shared and it includes links to the capital request form, the capital guide, the tendering policy, as well as contact information. And now I'm gonna pass it over to our colleagues in CFS. Hi everyone, uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Roberto Hernandez, a Regional Program Manager with the Child Family Services uh, Directorate in the Ontario region. I have my colleagues here with me, Oksana Mish and Amanda Irvine, who are senior officers on the team. Uh, and before we begin, we do have our own presentation, but I wanted to say thank you for the invitation for having us here. Hopefully we can provide you with some information that is useful to you and your communities. I'll just pass it over to uh, Amanda, uh, Oksana. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us again. Uh, so when assessing eligibility of capital funding being requested related to the First Nation Child and Family Services Program, we take into consideration that the capital assets support the delivery of First Nation Child and Family Services on reserve. Um, it promotes substantive equality and culturally appropriate services, ensuring that the capital asset uh, being requested through uh, CHRT 41 fits within long-term related plans and objectives. The costs are recognized as necessary to purchase, construct, and renovate the asset. The documentation demonstrates value for money um, and generally accepted accounting principles, applicable tendering policies, and applicable federal, provincial, and local laws and federal um, regulations are followed. So funding is available to support the delivery of First Nation Child and Family Services Program, which includes prevention, protection services, uh, First Nation representative services, formerly known as the band representative services, as well as post-majority support services. Um, some examples of assets and projects being requested under CHRT 41 includes purchases. So this can involve land, modular units, existing buildings, vehicles, and um, assets to support the delivery of your services under the uh, First Nation Child and Family Services Program. Uh, it also includes renovations to existing homes, offices, or other capital assets that's required to deliver those services. Um, and it also funding is available through this funding stream for construction of new homes for emergency transitional housing, multi-purpose facilities or assets for land-based programming. Funding is available through the CHRT funding stream um, for transitional and emergency housing to support individuals or families who are accessing services through either the First Nation representative services, prevention, or post-majority support services. We align the approach to determine eligible models for transitional or emergency housing with the definition from the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. 
which indicates that durations of individual stay typically is between three months and three years. Requests for transitional and emergency housing assets may include purchase of modular units, existing homes, uh, buildings, or construction of new buildings. Construction or purchase of off-reserve property is eligible where there's no suitable property available on reserve for construction um, or where off-reserve construction is more accessible for uh, First Nation children, youth, and families on reserve to receive the services. So very similar to the life cycle that our colleagues just shared with you, the First Nation Child and Family Services Program also follows a phased approach, which includes the four stages that you see here on the screen. The first one being pre-capital. This involves completion of a needs assessment, which is also referred to as a program operational plan. Uh, this confirms the type of assets needed to deliver services. And um, this assessment also provides an overview of your current and future uh, program and service needs. Um, funding is also available at this stage for the completion of a feasibility study. Um, as Catherine spoke to it, it presents the details and project and details on the project and project viability. Um, so this would typically include geotechnical investigations, site surveying, site servicing, environmental assessments, um, cost for tendering, cl class D or C construction costs. Uh, so these are just some of the examples, but they're not limited to. At the design stage of the life cycle, this in could include costs that are also not limited to, but completion of detailed designs, a class B construction estimate, and costs uh, for tendering as well. At the third stage of construction, uh, costs can be included for professional project management, costs for construction based on Class B estimates may be also requested. And finally, at the um, completion stage, this can include costs for project management fees, furnishings, uh, cost overruns. Um, again, these are just examples and it's very, it's not limited to what can be included in these. This is just how the life cycle is broken down. So we also, um, the Government of Canada's website has a capital um, delivery guide, which is a great resource tool. It breaks down uh, the first chapter speaks to the child and family services portion of um, accessing funding under CHRT 41. The second chapter speaks to the requirements under Jordan's principle. Um, a lot of the information is similar. However, uh, the requirements do look different. Um, and then we also have um, the capital funding request, um, it's available online as well. Um, so the first, um, first contact information listed here is our general inbox where capital funding requests are submitted to. Um, and the second one is our general inbox where if you have any questions, concern, need any help accessing the forms, then you can definitely reach out to our general inbox there. Um, and then just our regional contact information. So Lexi's our director, Roberto, who's here with us. Um, everybody, yeah, the whole team. And then you'll see myself and Amanda's contact information on the slides there. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Um... I I also wanted to to recognize um, we don't have any NAN community members up on the panel with us. Jocelyn Sutherland um, had planned to be here. Um, unfortunately, she, she got um, tied up with with some duties in Fort Albany and and wasn't able to make it. But wanted to share her experience um, and the work they're doing with CHRT forty one money in her community. Um, and I know um, she'd be happy to share that with you when, when we're all together again. But I, I, we do have some time now for some questions, if there are any from the floor. Um, if you have any, again, wave your hand and I'll, I'll try to see you. Um, but in, in the meantime, maybe, oh, there is a question, Chief. 
Um, we'll we'll get the microphone over to you, Chief. Chief, if you don't mind just introducing yourself in your community. When okay. You uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Chief Lefty Kamano Arvan from Burskin Lake First Nation. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, there was four items that that were listed there, like uh, prevention, protection, ban rep, and post-majority. Um, and, and I want to have a question on post-majority. Uh, I guess that's uh, where... Uh, uh child uh, those that came that uh came out of care from 18 to 26 i believe the eligibility and i don't know when uh, i had asked before when this uh, uh program was introduced to the people because only we've only heard about it i've only heard about it two years ago and uh and by that time uh some of our then clients have uh uh have aged out, which which I which I found disappointing, and I and I asked again, when did this uh, uh, program came into effect? Was it four years ago? Oh uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Chief. Um, to my knowledge, post majority was introduced in twenty one twenty two. Um, so it is relatively new, and so you, your understanding would be correct with that. Okay, so uh, so there's nothing we can do for those people, those young youth that uh, aged out already? So it, it depends. If they have aged out of care, but they're under the age of 26 still, then definitely we can assess their eligibility. I mean, I don't know the specific details, but we can look into it uh, together. So it depends if they are under the age of 26 or above the age of 26 at this point. Okay, thank you. No problem. I, I did expect there might be some interest in post-majority care today. And and certainly if there's other questions about post-majority care or, or anything else, um, is there anyone else who has a, a question? It, it, and it's also, Jeff, if, if it's yeah. okay, we do have a presentation about post-majority. We didn't bring it with us, just figuring that we we're here for housing, but we can definitely share it with the organizers if, if it helps for distribution. Yeah, De definitely. And I think that that's useful. Um, I don't know if you're here this morning. I don't know when you came in, but there was a, a presentation about um, youth and access to housing that, that I think would tie these things together. Sure. Yep. Um, is there anyone else on the floor with a question? If not, I'm holding a microphone, so I maybe I get to ask one too. And and maybe just for folks who are here today, if you might be able to give some examples, I, either you know in the north or or across Ontario, of what some capital projects look like, maybe to give a, a little bit of color for folks here who haven't might not be familiar with what they can build with with a CHRT forty one money or related money. Um, you know, we we have mostly housing folks in the room, and so. What do these projects look like on the ground if you can give and you don't need to tell us where or real details but you know if you can give us some idea of, of what has been built or what could be built using the funding sure. um thanks for that for um to be honest with you for construction projects we're very limited because chrt 41 the applications opened in 2022 so with the majority of the communities being remote um we taking the winter road and shipping uh, materials and supplies up is a consideration. Um, however, on uh, the Jordan's principal component, we currently have two that are under construction currently. One is remote and one is an urban reserve. Uh, the urban reserve is completing a storage garage for uh, the land-based equipment. And the remote First Nation, they have brought in modular units for housing. And that is for the allied health professionals that come in and out of the First Nation to deliver services to kids. So I, I think we heard in the we heard in the previous presentation the need for for staff housing, and I think that that fits right in there. And so for for folks who who in your community that might be a need, I think this is a, an avenue to consider. So yeah, and we do actually have one project that is currently. 
um, possibly out for tender. I'm just not sure where it is in that process. And that's a joint project with uh, CFS and Jordan's principal. And that is more for an office type structure. So kids would be going to the office to receive um, services. So whether it's occupational health, um, counseling, physical therapy, art therapy, services like that. Great. Thank you. And do you want to offer as well? Absolutely. Yeah. From a CFS perspective, we've had many capital projects. Uh, difficult to have provide an exact number, but we've had quite a few. And generally, we have all different types, but we normally look at office space uh, to run the programs that you need in your or have in your community. So if you have a band rep program, for example, and you need office space for your staff, you need family visit rooms, you need a kitchen, washroom, anything that would go into a building to provide the service, that would be uh, eligible under CHRT 41 for CFS. Same thing for post-majority. Sometimes we'll see multiple programs housed under one roof, which also makes sense if they all align with uh, our uh, FNCFS programs. And if they don't, we look at a proration depending on what kind of services or other programs are in the building. Uh, these can be, you know, totally new construction. They could be modular. Uh, this also includes the purchase of the land if you need to do per uh, purchase the land. Um, and specifically tying it to the housing here, the, like the whole topic, uh, transitional homes are something that we've also seen for youth that may be transitioning out of care where, you know, they need a place to stay after having transitioned out of care. And there may be some programming that the First Nation will run out of these homes. Uh, we we have seen projects like that where either it's a construction of a home or a purchase of an existing home that suits your needs. And uh, we have been able to fund several of those types of programs or uh, projects. Um, that's particularly exciting. Maybe not to, to get ahead of ourselves, but I, I know tomorrow morning there, there will be a presentation um, about community-led design for specialized housing in the North. And I know within that project, there are designs that could specifically meet um, that need, the transitional housing need with, with services delivered. So for all of you in the room who, who that may be a need in your community of post-majority care, I think there's some things that you'll hear both here and tomorrow from the design side that, that might leave you with some ideas, or I, I hope leave you with some ideas. Um, we have a question in the front from, from the elder. Thank you. I'm just curious, um, you talk about uh, applications for the capital assets uh, under JP. Do you, like, we're, we're hearing there's a backlog, like, are you dealing with a whole huge number of applications in Ontario? Just for the panelists, do you want to introduce yourself and where you're from? Uh, Ro so. Rosie Mosquito. <laughs> I'm from Bearskin Lake. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we do not work in Jordan's principal. We work under operations, which is falls for the health facilities program. So we work in partnership with our Jordan's principal team to help deliver the CHRT 41 component. We focus on more on the technical um, design construction, that type of um, aspect. So I no, they are working on the backlog. I just can't speak to that because I'm not, um, I don't have that information. But if you want, I can take back your question and get your contact information and have someone follow up with you if that helps. Are there any um, final questions from, from the floor for, for the folks we have up here with us? Okay. Um, our next move is is the most complicated move of the day because folks are going to have to leave this room for the first time. Um, on your name badge, on the left hand, well, it depends which way you're looking at it, if it's left or right, doesn't it? Um, it should say delegate, and then under where it says delegate, it should say a room name. For about a third of you, you get to stay right here. You've won, you're lucky. Um, for everyone else, it will say either Viking or Scandia. Um, neither one of them is very far. We can all do this. Um, but your next session will be in one of those rooms. 
and this is the one where everyone gets to talk and stop listening to me. So um, take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, but then if you can head towards the room that it says on your badge, um, either ballroom, Viking, or Scandia. And to the folks joining us online, if there is still anybody, this session will not be online, but um, we'll be starting those workshops in about 10 or 15 minutes in the room that's on your name badge. And um, if we could, just one last thank you for our panelists here. Thank you.
the trade show booths had some prizes and uh, I got the names here. So uh, the prizes you can pick up at the Odin room just around the corner where uh, tag is set up. So the, uh, the McMunn and Yates uh, prize pack is, uh, the winner of that was uh, Candice Gagnon. And uh, the next prize was for um, from Steel Corp Assemblies and that's from uh, uh, Tessa Nagoji on that. Um, this is for, oh, the, the TV. Um, this one, one, John Paul Spade. Um, no, is it? Okay, so I'm, I'm getting confused on the, the actual prizes, sorry. <laughs> Unless there was two TVs there, was there? Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, the, the next prize was uh, for Janet Fletcher. Um, the next one was um, for uh, Ma, uh, Ron Misuez. And the, the last one was uh, Brianna Miles. Yeah, so again, the prizes are in the old Odin room, just around the, down the hallway to your right, where uh, to get a uh, tag is set up. Um, yeah, so I'll just make this quick. I know it was a long day. Um, There's a lot of good feedback. Uh, thank you to all the presenters that came up here um, and sharing the information, all the good work that's happening in the communities. Thank you to... Um, um, uh, ISK for providing the information on uh, Jordan's principal and the CH, uh, CHRT uh, capital funding that's available. Um, and thank you to um, uh, to our, our elders, uh, Martha and uh, Rosie, for, for providing uh, opening comments in the prayer. So um, I'll leave it at that. Have a good evening, uh, and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thanks.